Are trans women actually women? How is this progress for women? And it's clear that legally and socially we are. So why exclude us from sport? They don't want equality, they want advantages. Let's, in the most respectful way possible, dive into the dicey subject of competing in sports as a transgender female. I finished in 7.23 seconds. That was the top time among biological girls. Four of those state championship titles should have been mine. Instead of me purely giving you my opinion, That's my opinion! This video is going to be unique because I'm going to be presenting you with scientific research studies, peer-reviewed literature, publications, and biological observations that are seen throughout one's lifetime. I'll show you facts so that you can form an opinion rather than the other way around. And disclaimer, it's important that throughout this video we separate feelings and emotions with logic and science. Dominating the competition at the girls track and field championships coming in first and second place respectively Now why am I informing you about this subject besides this being a hot topic lately? I'm also in the LGBT community. I'm gay I'm a doctor and I have a scientific background that can really look at this objectively because ultimately it is so important to walk in the light of the truth We can kindly talk about the subject But also look at what the science says and that is that there are innate biological differences between someone who was born as a male And someone who was born as a female and quick refresher Cisgender means that you identify as the gender that you were presumed to be at birth and then transgender of course means that you transition genders And before we get more into the science There's a great distinction between two different types of settings in the sports world There are less competitive non-competitive settings like for example an intermarriage local soccer team. These events don't have large life-changing prizes at stake. And then on the other hand, there are legitimately very competitive settings where there's a lot of emphasis placed on how well you do in the competition. Examples include like high school state championships where scholarships are on the line for college. There's also college NCAA tournaments or professional leagues where money is at stake. And then another classic example is Olympic trials. These are all events that people train for for years to reap benefits and gain a reward. Set records, receive awards, medals, recognition, that's completely different than, like I said, playing on your local soccer intramural team for fun. And this is a real thing. For example, high school state championships where transgender women get the top places and cisgender women are pushed down in their rankings. So we'll have to look at the evidence to evaluate if it's fair. And really quick, I said we're going to separate emotions and feelings in this discussion, so let's briefly address them. People who experience gender dysphoria are some of the highest groups of people that experience mental health issues. In fact, the LGBT community in general disproportionately struggles with their mental health. Not always, you're not destined to be faced with mental illness if you are gay, lesbian, bi, trans, but the odds go up. I think in general, it's important to be respectful and open-minded when talking about the subject. It costs zero dollars and zero cents to be nice, and it's 2022, you can do whatever you want. Transition, come out, do you. If you're not bothering other people, I don't care. So if you're like me, you can support trans people having access to medical care at accessible rates. You can support transgender people using whatever restroom they desire. You can encourage and promote trans acceptance in the media and in the general community. I also have multiple trans friends. We're all simply human beings, but we can also step back and look at the equality and fairness of transgender women competing with cisgender women in sports that are specifically geared towards competitive settings where prizes are on the line. And while it was a state race, their wins are making national headlines. Not because of what they did, but because of who they are. We have to dive into the science, so the doctor in me is going to come out. Starting from the very beginning, a fetus with XY chromosomes, which is for a male, will produce and be exposed to higher levels of testosterone from the jump. Now, when a baby is delivered and born, they're either male, female, or intersex, which is a different conversation. Interestingly, studies show that before puberty, naturally, boys and girls have very similar athletic abilities. There's not a huge difference. This is most likely why it's common to see co-ed sport leagues for young kids, like a soccer league, for example, boys and girls playing together. But all of this changes when males gain a large biological advantage in terms of athletic abilities during puberty. Males experience a massive increase in a hormone called testosterone. During male puberty, Testosterone drives the development of bigger muscles with more fast twitching fibers. During puberty, males have a 20-fold increase in testosterone levels. This is on average 15 times higher than testosterone levels in females. Now, testosterone creates many changes in the male adolescent body. Common changes you might associate with puberty are like your voice deepening, growing body hair, growing in height, and testosterone also behind the scenes give many athletic advantages throughout the entire body. Things regulated include bone mass, fat distribution, muscle masses, and 
red blood cell concentrations, which carry oxygen throughout the body. Attributes like larger skeletal structures, larger muscles, increased cardiovascular and respiratory functions, as well as higher power to weight ratios gives cisgender males more natural athletic abilities. And these differences in cisgender women and cisgender men create differences in both non-elite calibers as well as elite sporting competitions. There are natural differences between each sex. This table shows the magnitude of physiological differences between untrained or moderately trained males with females as the reference value. So on average, males have 45% more lean body mass, 33% more lower muscle mass, and 40% more upper body muscle mass. Men naturally have more muscle strength, longer bone lengths, like in your arms and legs, 83% more force in their tendons, and as we briefly mentioned earlier, increased respiratory and lung functions, as well as enhanced cardiac function. So whether you're an Olympic track star or you're someone who's learning basketball for the first time, once puberty comes, males generally innately have a natural biological advantage. That's not to say that there are not incredible female athletes. There absolutely are. An elite female athlete can definitely outperform most non-elite male athletes. Like I'm sure there's a female in every single sport out there that could kick my butt in something <laughs> because I'm not an elite athlete by any means in any realm. Like I'm good at sports and I'm athletic, but I'm also not professional. But when we compare males to females in similar calibers, so non-elite arenas and elite arenas, males naturally and on average, not always, outperform females because of biological differences, which is why males and females typically compete in separate sporting events. Males just naturally have an athletic advantage based on their development. And this is really why by the time of middle school, like 11 years old, typically we see sports go off into separate genders, as I said. That is simply the cold hard truth so that there are equal playing grounds for people in their respected sport. And then when do boys typically start playing American football where you use a lot of force and muscle and strength? Typically around the age that puberty starts. I mean, there are people who start earlier. I was not a football kid, I was too big of a noob. But it has to do with how we evolutionarily transform as humans. Now, this fascinating study that just came out at the time I'm making this video looked at the differences and advantages that males have to females in specific sports. And what I think is interesting is that some sports, males had naturally more of an advantage than others. For example, males have a much higher baseline advantage in activities like weightlifting, pitching a baseball, or performing a field hockey drag flick. And even think about it, softball, which is primarily played by females, they throw the underhand ball, whereas in baseball, men throw it overhand. On the other hand, according to the study, men are still biologically advantaged in sports like rowing, swimming, and track running, although the difference isn't as drastic. Still though, 10 to 13% still makes a notable difference. When looking at elite male athletes versus elite female athletes, adolescent schoolboys outperformed elite female adult athletes. So kids who are just going through puberty, boys specifically, can outperform grown women. There are just innate biological differences that go back to everything we were talking about that happens throughout the body as testosterone booms once puberty hits. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that women do not receive nearly as much testosterone that men do that create the physical differences. Okay, let's switch over to transgender females specifically. So like I said, we're gonna be respectful, but also look at the science and evidence. So to do do this, we have to look at what physical and biological changes happen when a cisgender male transitions to a transgender female. This male to female transition entails going on something called testosterone suppression. So studies look at how athletic performance is altered after at least 12 months that a trans woman has gone through testosterone suppression because that's typically the minimum cutoff for trans women to compete back in competitive sports with cisgender females. Studies show that after a year of testosterone suppression when transitioning, there is a degree of physical advantages that do slightly decrease. An example is after a year, transgender women will typically have less of a thigh muscle mass. There are subtle differences and advantages that are lost when you transition, but there are also many biophysical aspects to someone who's gone through puberty that do not change when you transition from male to female. If a transgender female doesn't go through testosterone suppression before puberty, then they're going to have a lot of experiences that a cisgender female will have not gone through. So you're going to have larger bones on average. You're going to have more muscle mass. It does go down a little bit with testosterone suppression, but in general, the baseline is still higher. You're not going to be able to get rid of the male puberty that they've gone through, the fact that they have male biology. So even by reducing testosterone for one year, it's still not going to level the playing field. Height, stride, grip strength. Studies show that grip strength is 25% higher even after you transition. So there's still 
subtle differences. And the study from 2020 basically says that there are slight reductions in muscle mass, size, and muscle strength after transitioning from male to female. They go down a little bit, as I said, but that slight loss doesn't erase the natural differences between a cisgender male that went through puberty and a cisgender female that went through puberty. In the 70s and the 80s, we had the East German system where female athletes were filled full of testosterone and it made them unbeatable. So for nearly a whole generation, the East German women totally dominated in almost all female sports at, at Olympic and world level. But there are many British that came fourth and fifth and sixth and no one's ever heard of them because they didn't pick up a medal, which they should have done. So I feel quite passionately that I just don't want to see that happen to a whole generation of female athletes again. And you have to ask yourself, is that fair? It's not transphobic to stand back and ask yourself, is this fair to cisgender women? Because it's important to be allies of both transgender people as well as women who compete and train their whole lives to make it to such a high prestigious level. And then to lose your college record, to lose gold medals, to lose recognition, sponsorships, or just not get first place. That can be very disheartening to people. As a result, the rest of us have lost over 85 opportunities to qualify for higher levels of competition, losing scholarship opportunities, titles, and wider recognition. Now here's the thing that I think really sets off the trans community. And it, I mean, I get why it's offensive, but People use this as a reason to hate transgender people, to misgender people, to say mean messages, cyber bully them. You don't have to be transphobic to step back and objectively look at the situation and ask, is it completely fair? For the first time in nearly 50 years, they are tilting the playing field against women. That's not progress and that's not fairness. Completely ignoring what's going on is almost cisgender female athlete phobic. You're almost stripping away the rights of cisgender female athletes who have trained with a completely different hormonal and biological experience growing up. Now, you can disagree, but science doesn't lie. I think the biggest thing is we have to speak about this in a kind manner. When we attack people, that makes people resistant and it's hurtful. Now, given that I am in the LGBT community, I think that we would gain a lot of respect from other people if we stood back and looked at these hard facts and evidence and we maybe questioned what kind of solutions can we make to make everything a little bit more fair? That's my opinion. A lot of people suggest maybe we could make a large transgender female league of sports where there are specific competitions that have all transgender females. That's one suggestion. There are many different options, but as that research study said, every sport should consider evaluating what adjustments and rules they make based on the innate differences that people have. Playing for fun, doing regular stuff like intramural leagues and playing in a non-competitive fashion, that's completely different. You can do whatever you want. If we in the LGBT community want to be treated equally, I think it's also important that we treat cisgender female athletes equally as well and provide them the opportunities that are all aligned with how we have evolved as human beings and how things are very different throughout puberty based on the biological sex that you were born with. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.